Uh, no, let them, let them go. <laughs> if they want to leave, let them go. That's true. Yeah. In, 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 in uh, Buddhist psychiatry, Buddhist psychiatry, they think that when people are mentally a little bit deranged or a little bit over-depressed or a little bit something, that they attract such creatures, such subtle entities, and they go and plague them even worse. So you have to kind of get rid of them, and then the talking cure and the healing can take place. But first, you have to chase away these these entities, and um, they they believe that they inhabit in our country the hospitals and asylums and things like that. And they they over they extra because people like that are weakened already by whatever neurosis or psychosis they have, and then they then that makes them worse, you know, unable to recover. So, uh, so that you know. So this chant is to, to a bed and go in a Prozac. <laughs> okay, everybody ready? Is it enough light out there for you to read it? Is it okay? Okay. We're not going to do the Japanese way where you sort of do every syllable, but a little, little bit in that, because English is a polysyllabic word, but a little bit in that direction, okay? We start with the reading the titles, because it's considered good creates a good instinct to read them. <coughs> In Sanskrit, Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Vrdaya In Tibetan, Chonden Dema Shrapachin Ningo In English, the Blessed Lady Buddha Arthur Transcendent Wisdom Thus did I hear on a special occasion the Blessed Lord was dwelling on the vulture peak at Radhakurha, together with great communities of mendicants and bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed Lord entranced himself in the teaching samadhi called the illumination of the profound. Just then, the noble bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, was contemplating the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom. Come on, chime in, chime in, everybody. And he realized that those five body and processes are void of any intrinsic reality. Thereupon, impelled by the power of the Buddha, the noble party Buddha addressed the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, thus. Any noble son wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom. How should he learn? Then the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, addressed venerable Charadati Buddha, thus. Shari Buddha, when any noble son or noble daughter wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, he or she should realize it in this way. Those five body-mind processes should be truly realized to be void of any intrinsic reality. Matter is voidness. Voidness is matter. Voidness is not other than matter. Neither is matter other than voidness. Likewise, sensations, conceptions, mental functions, and consciousnesses are also void. Shariputra, thus all things are voidness, signless, uncreated, unceased, stainless, impeccable, and decreased and unincreased. Shariputra, thus in voidness there are no matter, no sensation, no conception, no mental function, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form or color, no sound, no scent, no taste, no texture, no idea. There are no sense media from eye to mentality sense media, and there are no consciousness media from visual to mental consciousness media either. There are no ignorance and no cessation of ignorance and so on, up to no old age and death and no cessation of old age and death either. Likewise, there are no suffering, no origination, no cessation, no path, no intuitive wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment either. Therefore, Shari Buddha, because the Bodhisattva is without attainment, he lives in reliance on transcendent wisdom. His spirit is unobscured and free of fear. Passing far beyond all confusion, she ultimately succeeds in nirvana. And all the Buddhas who live in past, present, and future rely on transcendent wisdom to reach manifesting perfect Buddhahood and unexcelled perfect enlightenment. Such being so, there is the mantra of transcendent wisdom, the mantra of great science, the unexcelled mantra, the uniquely universal mantra, the mantra that eradicates all suffering. 
It is not false and should be known as truth. The transcendent is the mantra as well as Padyata. Om Gate Gate Pada Gate Pada Sam Gate Bodhi Swahaprita. Om Gate Gate Pada Gate Pada Sam Gate Bodhi Swaha. Om Gate Gate Pada Gate Pada Sam Gate Bodhi Swaha. Shari Putra, the Sutra, the Bodhisattva, the great hero, learned the profound transcendence of wisdom. Thereupon the Blessed Lord arose from the Samadhi and applauded the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, excellent, excellent, noble son. One should practice the profound transcendence of wisdom in just the way you have taught it, and even the transcendent Buddhas will joyfully congratulate you. When the Blessed Lord has spoken thus, the Venerable Jaradati Putra, the Noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, everyone in that audience and the whole world, to this God, humans, titans, and fairies rejoice, and all applauded what the Buddha said. Okay, be gone, any kind of hindering spirit. <laughs> That's really fun. <clears throat> I give a little commentary, and then we'll do a little more of that, that four keys, the sound of four keys, so I have a little time to do that. Okay, so first of all, the blessed lady Buddha. Transcendent wisdom is a Buddha. She's considered the goddess wisdom, and she's female. And that's really an important thing, one point. Bhagavati, she's called. Second. Uh, blessed Lord in Bhagavan. And so Buddha doesn't actually teach this sutra. But indirectly he does by going into a samadhi and creating a field, illuminating the profound, and also the illumination from the profound, the clear light. So he creates like a field of clear light. And at that time, the teacher of this sutra, Avalokiteshvara, who himself, Ishvara, the last part of his name means God, and Avalokita means who looks after with concern. So who looks with love at the world below, Avalokita means. So it's kind of a critique of the Hindu idea of Maha Ishvara, the great creator God, you know, who's like beyond the world. You know? And Avalokita is a bodhisattva, actually, but one who is divine in that manifestation. He has many, many emanations, not just one. But this, you know, it's like celestial, you could say, Bodhisattva. And he's considered the already a Buddha whose vow as a Buddha was to be a Bodhisattva everywhere in order to promote the teaching of great compassion, universal compassion for all beings. So he's considered the universal compassion of all, of all Buddhas. And for example, the Karmapa Lama is considered to be his emanation. The Dalai Lama is considered to be his emanation. Uh, you know, he has a female counterpart called Tara, who also has many, many forms. So there are many around the and world. Isn't the Chinese Kuan what? Isn't Kuan Yin also? And the Chinese called Kuan Yin, and there can be male and female Kuan Yins, and they just keep the female name as, as Kuan Yin also. It's like calling a female. I'm going to For some reason, the Tara name did not transmit because she became much more popular in India in the last few centuries of Buddhism in India. And the Chinese, most translators came there only earlier. Mm -hmm. So for some reason, the Tara is not, you know, they don't, they don't have a different name. Like Tara would mean something like savioress. Tara literally means a savioress, a female, messiahs. It actually is the Hebrew word. It is, messiah, there is such a word. In English, it looks very bad. Messias. <laughs> and like messier, messi, or messi, messias, and messias, messiest. You know? But, uh, so, so they just don't have that in China. Mm -hmm. They just have male and female kanon, so kuan yin, mm -hmm. kuan shi yin, you know, they call it in Chinese. But she's the big Messiah figure in, in Mahayana Buddhism, you know, like a Christ figure in Mahayana Buddhism. So, so that's him, and, and, and that he, he, the compassion incarnation, in other words, teaches the profound wisdom teaching, is very significant. You know? So that's in second. Notice also how Shariputra, the male chauvinist head monk, who is quite enlightened in his own way, but all he asks is for any noble son, which is to engage in the practice. And then Avalokiteshvara, when he answers, he says, for any noble son or noble daughter. 
That's in there from thousands of years. Like tweaking him a little to like cut the cut the male children. Then usually people say emptiness is form and form is emptiness. The reason is that the word in Sanskrit rupa is has a double role at least. I mean sometimes Sanskrit words have many meanings, but at least an important double role. And one is where it is the object of the visual consciousness. So in other words, their form to stand in for shape and color is OK. But it, it also means one of the aggregates, where it means the material aggregate. And it includes material things that are not visible. So it isn't form. It is matter. And also, voidness, which is like the name for the absolute in a way, it's like voidness relativity. Voidness is matter. It's not because otherwise we might think emptiness, and I think many people do in the modern period. They think, you know, like an atom, the model we have of an atom, like a little mini solar system, tiny little nucleus. I think they give you in science classes, they say like a flea on home base, on home plate in Yankee Stadium. And the proton going around, or the electron going around, it makes the atom spinning around, is like another flea in the bleachers. You know, so mostly it's empty in a, in a conventional notion of emptiness. But emptiness, the nucleus is just as empty as the empty space. This is key point. So therefore the sort of shocking you know, contradiction that is meant that must be confronted is that matter is voidness. Voidness is matter. And why? Because matter can be solid, it can be impenetrable, it can fill space. But actually the matter is the space. Too. It just happens to be the other matter can't go there. But it can block the other matter because both are only relative, both are devoid of any intrinsic reality as a separate thing. Uh, otherwise, you couldn't contact, you couldn't, they couldn't touch each other. If each is empty of any non relational thing, so the material things can relate. Right? Mental things are also empty of any non essential thing, therefore, mental things can relate with material things for that matter. Okay? So the shocking thing, matter is voidness, is more accurate, actually, than emptiness is form. When you say emptiness is form, yeah, you can have, like Casper the ghost, he's an empty form, you know, and you don't really get the shock of it, you know, that this right here is empty. The floor is emptiness, just as much as the space in the air is empty. You get it? That's very, very key. And, uh, and that's all. Then, you know, all of the things that, the, now, this, you know, matter, Sensations, conceptions, mental functions, and consciousnesses are one set of terms for what are called the five aggregates, which is the body-mind complex, of which only one is the material body, and five are mental. From sensations up to consciousnesses, they are mental you know, phenomena. And that's very important. We're going to meditate about that in a minute. So just notice that. But he said he's, in other words, the same thing. You know, matter is voidness, voidness is matter, voidness is not other than matter, neither is matter other than voidness. You would go, if this were not this super brief heart sutra, you would go, Sensa voidness, sensations are voidness, voidness are, is sensations, Sense voidness is not other than sensations, neither are sensations other than voidness. In other words, the same four-way thing you do with the sensations, conceptions, mental functions, and consciousnesses in your meditation. Then these other things, this next list, are all, in a way, synonyms of voidness, in that they're all ultimate. Voidness, signlessness, actually should be, sorry, I have been done. Voidness, signlessness, uncreatedness, unceasedness, stainlessness, impeccability, undecreasedness, and unincreasedness. I didn't put all the nesses in there, but that's what they are. So they're all, you know, coming from different directions, of signs, of substance, of, of createdness, of being, you know, uh, uh, ceased and so forth. They're because of uncreated, therefore they're unceased. You know? Voidness is unceased as well. And then again, in voidness there are no, and he goes to five aggregates. Then he goes to six senses, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mentality. Because the sixth sense is a mentality sense. And then their objects, the form, co form or color is the visual object. Sound, scent, taste, texture, and idea. So those are called the 12 media, senses and their object, object uh, you know, uh, sense objects. 
there aren't a sentimental object. There are no sense media from eye to mentality sense media, and there are no consciousness media from visual to mental consciousness media either. The medias, media are 18 things, which include the consciousness. There are no ignorance and no cessation of ignorance, and these are the 12 links of dependent origination, which are around your, always around yeah. your wheel of life, uh, wheel of life and death, really, and they're around it, the 12 links that which the Buddha the only thing the Buddha ever drew once he was a Buddha, or wrote, supposedly, he made in the sand a wheel with those six, or actually sometimes it includes the gods and demigods or anti-gods mm -hmm. in the same That's one, one. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the other four. Or, and then sometimes there are two, so sometimes five or six. And then he puts the twelve links around that, and then, and then there are, um, uh, you know, see which each of the link is, is uh, represented by a scene. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, then the Yama, Yama, the god of death, holds it in his mouth. Finally, he gets the four noble truths. No suffering, no origination, no cessation, no path. You know, in Nirvana, in words, all these things are gone, even cessation is gone. No intuitive wisdom, and this is very key, no attainment and no non-attainment. Meaning, what, how, so we all, all already, attain, there's no non-attainment of Nirvana. Why is that? Well, because our super subtle mind, our clear light mind, already knows it's nirvana, and we are one with nirvana, and the rest of our subtle and coarse mind and body are, if you could say, made of clear light, but, you know, made of voidness, but that sounds strange, but you could say that. And so we already do know that, actually. But then we have this particular kind of misknowing mind that is sure we don't. So. That's we have to. So that's the that's the no attainment, and that mind doesn't attain, but we already attain from the super subtle mind. But on the other hand, to make that super subtle mind our total mind, that's the whole path. In other words, so we're only coming back to what our real reality is, and even the reality of our intuitive knowledge is, you know. And so there's no non-attainment. So don't tell me you're not in nirvana. Make that an excuse for for making war on on somebody, on the Ukraine or something. Okay, then the mantra, then when this, when my translation of the Heart Sutra was translated into Spanish, it said, Om Puerta Puerta, Puerta Grande, Puerta Muy Grande. So then I learned to, which I didn't do in this printing, I should have put a Y in the end, Gate, Gate, Gate. And Gate means gone. So gone, gone, Super gone, super totally gone. Paragate means super gone, parasamgate means totally gone, and bodhi means enlightenment, and swaha means all hail or welcome. And may all be good, swaha means suaha, when I say good, kind of thing. Say good, means like that. <laughs> and those five versions of gone, and then bodhi has arrived in nirvana, in enlightenment, in non-dual nirvana, samsara, non-dual enlightenment. Uh, they correspond to what are called the five paths, path of preparation, path of application, I mean path of accumulation, path of application, path of vision, path of meditation, as part of samgate, and path of no more learning is enlightenment itself. Those are called the five paths. And then Buddha praises them, and as he always says, sadhu, sadhu, excellent, excellent. And everybody is very happy, and everybody's congratulating, and every, the whole world, everyone's happy about the hearts. <laughs> okay. So now let's meditate. Okay, back to the four key. This time we're going to do four key meditations. Okay, so we're going to meditate mode. And now that you learn to find your traumatic memory when you are injured in a sense, and your loved one accused you of some heinous thing when you're innocent, and you are so upset that you got accused, and you have that feeling like a really solid you, innocent you rises up and kind of gives you a congested feeling in your solar plexus, maybe a choked feeling in your throat, so that when you protest your innocence, you kind of can't get the words out, you know, in the, in the dramas, you know, where the hero is framed in the movies or the plays, you know, and then the hero kind of stammers out his alibi so they don't listen, and then, you know, it's a whole drama is him proving his innocence, remember? And then you get frustrated if you're like me and you don't like tragedies. And you're like, why don't you say you were over there? You know, get a little upset. 
yes. <laughs> and they never seem to do it because they're choked up because they're so, so filled with this injured innocence that they kind of can't function sensibly. You know, so, so okay, you do that in your memory. Okay, got that in your memory. And observing from your little spying consciousness, your witness consciousness, from behind the, behind the screen, and you see yourself feeling, oh, I'm innocent, and I, and of course, undeniably, there's I there on the self there. The ego is there, a real ego, really my ego, etc. all that. Okay, you, you sort of know that, right? Where you kind of don't think, you think selflessness is a little bit stepping on your toes. Okay, you get to that, then you decide, okay, I'm going to have a practical outcome. But at least, okay, Buddha and Nagarjuna and company and Avalokiteshvara, I'll take the challenge. And I will try to find, and I'll show you that real self I have. So I'll look for it. Okay. Now we look at, now you're gonna, we're going to do five aggregates. This is a four, this is not the royal reason of relativity, this is five aggregates. So we're going to say, okay, now this self that's in there, that I can feel, clogging me up when I'm injured innocent, then it might be the same, it must be the same as some part of my mind-body complex. So I'm going to look for it. Is there anything in my material aggregate or process that could be the unchanging fixed real me? So now in meditation, you go into your sense of your own anatomy and you, you look for a real you, the unchanging one that's your identity you, meaning stays the same, always, identity, stays the same. You know? And is there a little homunculus bomb inside the, my heart cave? in my mind, in my heart cave, something. Is there, is there a neuron in my brain that's the really un the one unchanged neuron that it gets the digital download of the, my experience and without changing itself? Is there such a thing? And pretty soon, if you have a sense of your anatomy, you do a body scan, as dear John kabat would call it. You scan yourself from head to toe, from nerve, from circulatory system, from organs, from brain, from neural system, from energies flowing in those systems. And is there anything unchanged? And then maybe you might have an idea of some sort of atomic you. But luckily we have quantum physics. We're so lucky to live in an era past quantum physics where even there's no indivisible particle anymore. A few people are insisting to try to find one, but there isn't one. They haven't found it. And so your material aggregate will dissolve under your analysis without your finding the real whatever your name is. In my case, the real Bob. As a material entity, I cannot find. Okay, so then I move from that. There I kind of concede, okay, no material self. Fixed, fixed me, self, independent, absolute, intrinsically real, inherently existent, or whatever, all the different things. Way we, Descartes couldn't find it. Well, he was looking in mind over there. And the second, go to sensations. We'll look at your aggregate of sensations, your heap of sensations. When you feel your body, like right now, if I go down and feel my toes on the ground, in my happy socks, scrunched on the ground, cross ankle, because I'm meditating. And I have sens tactile sensations, which are not just the uh, physical f flesh and bone in inside resting on solid rug, but my sensation of them resting on solid rug. Maybe the sensation of the cloth of my pant leg on my thigh. Maybe the sensation of my belt, the sensation of the t-shirt on my chest, and the sensation of my, of my glasses on my nose, and the, 
you know, inventory, note that a lot of parts of your body you don't have a sensation just now, at least that you don't pay attention to. And then are there internal sensations? Do you, if, you're, if your heart is difficult or do you have a kind of a lung suggestion, do you have a, or your rib or something, do you feel from the inside of the skin, the rib? I don't actually know, do I feel that? Maybe I sort of feel the, the skin being stretched, but I don't know if there are nerves inside that feel the rib. I guess so there are nerves even in the bone. So in all of those sensations, now when I felt, when I felt very strongly, which in a way we did so quickly, we maybe only simulated. When I felt very strongly, the very solid me inside me, the injured innocent me, that was almost like a sensation because it felt, it sort of felt, made me feel congested in the solar plexus. It sort of bothered my breathing and came up in my chest and then made my throat feel choked, like I didn't, I'm innocent and something. So there, those were sensations. But is there one of them that is the sensation? And when you do that exhaustively, going around inside your nervous system, feeling all sensations, tech, which are more or less tactile mostly, you give up the idea that, there, that the real you is a sensation, which is the coarsest level of mind. Then you go to concepts conceptions or concepts, the recognitional conceptual heap or aggregate. Well, I do have bar. That's a word. It's a sound. It looks like something written in English letters on a page. B-O-B. And it's a movement of my lips, bob, where which the ah sound departs from and the b and n ends up on the b bob. But what's unchanging and fixed about that? Besides, sometimes people call me Thurman, sometimes they call me Hey You, sometimes I react to different things, is I'm Robert or something. So is Bob really my fixed identity and you, or an image of yourself? If it's an image of yourself in a photograph on your driver's license, but that was only taken at a particular moment and you look different at other moments. So images, words, symbols, concepts of yourself, somehow they keep become like a kind of buzzy. Henry William James did this meditation without knowing about the Buddhist thing. And he said there was just a buzzing, blooming confusion of swirling ideas in his aggregate of conceptions. So then you reject that one. And then you look at your emotions. Well, when I feel innocent, I have a hurt feeling. I'm about to be indignant and mad, and I'm also very sad. And those are emotions, and um, you know I have all kind of deep structural ideas of up and down and me and the other, and all many things. And my friend, you know, my concepts about my friend, and all these emotions and my attachment to my friend, and so forth, and my horror that they think I would have done such and such. And all these emotions and reactions in the mind, mental reactions. But, but none of them seem to be stable. They don't seem to be unchanged. They're all causal and relational, so they don't seem to be me. So then I come to consciousness, so that I reject a mental function or a mental reaction, aggregate, and then I, as being one with that fixed self that I think I feel I have. So well, it must be in my consciousness. So then, but then let's look at how my consciousness actually functions. So then I look at my visual consciousness because sometimes it's very involved in what I'm seeing. They say my mental consciousness aligns with my visual consciousness to pay attention to the visual objects working through the visual sense power, sense faculty. Then I have a hearing one, then I have a smelling one, then I have a tasting one, and I have a tactile one, and all of those are changing with their objects. My tactile one, when I'm touching a smooth surface, I have a certain consciousness, and then I touch a sharp thing, and it's a little bit pain there, a pain sensation mixes in that consciousness, and all of it is changeable. Then I recognize the chair arm, and my concept of a chair arm comes in and helps me recognize that. In the in in power of associations, 
And so that's, those are all very changeable. None of them are fixed. And then my mental consciousness is always jumping around, picking out this sense stimulus or that one. And when I'm doing a visual one, it doesn't notice the tactile one and vice versa. And then sometimes it just goes in an inner imaginative space, of my inner theater of imaginations, and inner images, and inner voice, inner monologue. And when it does that also, the monologue is, da, 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 you shouldn't go here, come there, what about, what are you doing, you're meditating, you're looking for this, you're being mindful, you're not being mindful, blah, blah, blah. There's an inner thing going on in there that's always changing. And so where, where, what is my vision of emptiness? Wait a minute, emptiness is just like space, how there is no vision of it except maybe the, of a kind of nothingness. But I imagine nothingness might be, but then in fact nothingness is not a space. So consciousness it seems to be almost always changing. But maybe, I, maybe I, could I have a consciousness of an absolute? Could I have a consciousness of nirvana? Consciousness of emptiness? Then that, is that the unchanging thing? But then that wouldn't have anything registered in it because it would be a state of disappearance. So would that be it? Well, that wouldn't be relating to me, just nothing or in, in disappearance. So then even consciousness eludes itself being discoverable as an intrinsically real, intrinsically objective, objective intrinsically identifiable, intrinsic identity thing. And actually, Descartes reached here <coughs> If you've ever, any of you studied Descartes? And he also found he couldn't find himself, his self, his subjective self, he couldn't find. He admitted that. But then he tricked himself a little bit. Or he didn't have someone maybe, there's an odd thing in Buddhism, which says to understand selflessness, you have to hear it or learn it from someone else who understands selflessness, which is kind of, Quadruple bind, I call it. It's very odd. Because which self? The, both of them don't have a self, but they, and you have to hear that. So, but of course, you hear it from the conventional self of someone who has understand a lack of ultimate self, and then your conventional self can recognize your lack of ultimate self. So somehow there's a communication element. I don't know. I can't explain it. They say that, and Descartes didn't have that. So then he tricked himself to say that well, all I am is a subjectivity then. And the reason I couldn't find myself is I'm looking for myself as an object. So I don't exist as an object. I exist as a subject. And therefore I think, therefore I am. However, my existence as a subject is no longer dubitable by me. So therefore it can be my absolute point of certainty. So here he fastened on that thing that you can find in your own visual, audio, any kind of consciousness that this is somehow reaching, although all of this process of cognition is changing, it's reaching the unchanged me that owns it all. But it doesn't change me to own it. You know, it owns the changeable experience without changing. To that point, to that irrational and easily refutable logically point of an absolute functioning as a relative without being relative. And so, in fact, Descartes made has this point of certainty, which is actually a point of recognizing and acknowledging conventionality. What I think therefore I am means that my thinking makes me be here. So if I think a good thing about I, my am, then my am is something good. If I think a bad thing, it's something bad. Because my, my thinking creates my relative self, which is a work in progress and not a fixed thing. Imprisoned within the illusion that the real one is the fixed thing. So Descartes was at the doorway of recognizing the absoluteness of conventionality, the emptiness of, rel of relativity, or emptiness as relativity, and actually coming up with a pragmatism, actually, rather than some certain system, some system of of, of sort of subtly resurrected absolutism. You know, I, I, the one thing I'm sure of in the universe, no devil could trick me that I am, because I think so. And that's an absolute, but it isn't. That's a relative 
assertion of a relative self. And once I am such and such at the moment, I can be better. I can be more. Also, I can be worse. I can be less. Which is the, the coping with conventionality. And also, I can be aware of others equal to my awareness of myself. And my habit of self-preoccupation, I can, the, my addiction, my of self-addiction, even you could say, I can begin to moderate and become more other addicted, or expand to identify with others and become more other aware, and more out, therefore more empathetic and more altruistic, considering their pains and difficulties sort of equal importance to my pains and difficulties. Perhaps at first a few people, and we already do that as a human being, with my child, my beloved, my friend, my lover, my parent, whatever, perhaps, or my whatever. I do already do that. I identify with them to some extent, but to a limited extent, and very changeable, because I am very changeable, because I'm a relative process. So, but anyway, the, the third key, therefore, the end of the third key is going past Descartes, correcting Descartes, if you will, going with him and then going past him in this circle of looking for that fixed self within the relative subjectivity, with, with the relative subjectivity keeps encountering its relativity, but keeps spinning around because it feels that somehow the core of that subjectivity and relativity is some non-relative, unchanging me, some ego, some self, that really doesn't change, that's the real me, the really real me. But when one keeps spinning and keeping not finding that, then the second key comes in place, and then somehow, it's like you look for the elephant and you keep looking and looking and looking, and then finally you, you kind of acknowledge, you cope with the fact that there's no elephant. You never have a clear-cut consciousness of no elephant, although what you do have is when you really press this very, very determinedly, the self spinning on the self, looking for its, its indivisible, indestructible component, and still not finding, but still feeling it's there, so still drilling down upon itself, you, you go into what's called the diamond-like samadhi. If you have that kind of concept, you have to have, to really reach the goal, you have to have strong, one-pointed concentration, samadhi power. And when you reach that, then, in a way, it's like a diamond drill bit drilling a diamond. And they're both equally hard, and they both equally melt. And everything melts, and you have a blissful relief where everything disappears. And your last dangerous fortress of your intrinsic identity or self-habit is your feeling that that disappearance is yourself because you entered it, but it seems absolute, because it seems like infinite space. And that's what, when things dissolve, it seems like nothing is what's left there. But when you then look for the nothing, you look for the vast infinite space, of course, that will also dissolve. And then you will realize emptiness is the relativity. But there's that danger because it's kind of like, it feels like a mystical experience, and there is a relief, kind of vast, expansion into this disappearance. And, and also, it's not like you are in your normal body-mind complex are floating in a vast space. You, you disappear, actually. And you, you fear maybe you're going to become nothing, you're going to go crazy, you're going to not know who you are when you come to the brink of that experience. So it's very important you are forewarned reasonably that you can't become nothing because there is no such thing. And any relative experience of seemingly absolute space is just a relative experience of another relative thing, assumed to conform to your definition of the absolute. But actually, since you're experiencing it, it's relative. Even though when you really go deeply into it, it almost seems like you disappear 
the threshold seems like to be like a gateway to nothingness. And so that seems like, wow, that's the absolute. But at that point, you realize that there is no nothingness, and therefore all there is is all of the somethingnesses. Emptiness is relativity. And then that's called the realization of freedom from a true unity of the, of the self, the unrealistic self, and the body-mind processes. But then the, the fourth key, so that's the third key, the realization, and there's a lot of reasoning that you can learn ahead of time that you sort of implement. It gives you like a program, you memorize, you have a program to sort of avoid getting stuck anywhere, and especially get, avoid getting stuck in the seeming nowhere that you reach, which is the most dangerous place to get stuck. Uh, the, my, one of my great teachers, Tara Toko, his name, previous life, he said, he put it brilliantly that I can't imagine anybody, I never heard from anywhere else or read anywhere. He said, your relative self is all that you've ever had. You've never been an absolute self. Any absolute self that somehow might, you might have thought might be you would be irrelevant to you because it wouldn't relate to you. Because it's absolute and absolute means doesn't relate. So you've only ever had a relative self, but your relative self, since time immemorial, beginningless time, has been imprisoned within your assumption, your delusory assumption that you really are an absolute self. So when you see through that delusion of being an absolute self, and it sort of loses traction over you, it, I mean, it doesn't exist, but the constructed assumption does. And when it loses its grip over you, it takes your sense of relational self away with it, because they're used to be entwined, entangled. And so then the key there is to make sure that you realize that your, even your experience of an absolute place of voidness, of beyondness, of nothingness, of beyond nothingness, whatever, however absolute you want to make it, is itself only a relative experience, even though those are concepts of seemingly absolute things. But any experience of the reality of them is a relative experience, and not the absolute. So then the fourth key, so then you've reached actually a kind of a deep experience through the freedom from true unity of self and life processes, body-mind processes, aggregates. But then what you do is you go at another degree of subtlety, fourth key, you say, well, but I still feel that's I'm this real self. So maybe this real self is something apart from the body-mind processes, but somehow owns them, is their foundation, is there content, or is there master, or something like that? Is there owner? And so you, there's all different modes of relationship between an absolute and a relative that you then start to re-examine. And thinking of yourself as a material entity, as a mental entity, as different kinds of mental entities. And of course, you always come up against the royal reason of relativity here, that, any, that an owner cannot be absolute to own their own thing. Because their own thing is relative. To own it, you have to relate to it. So, any, you know, like, you know, they have these mystical things like the silver, unchanging soul, the Egyptian thing is high up somewhere at the top of the pyramid. And there's a silver, subtle core that goes down to the body-mind complex. And the real soul thing is outside, but connected by a cord. You know, and all kind of different soul theories people have have elaborated, human beings have elaborated over in different cultures and civilizations and centuries to sort of justify their sense of being a fixed thing in a completely changeable world out of feeling threatened by being involved in this changeable world. And so you go into every form of that you can, permutation of that you can think of, and you always come up through the royal reason of relativity that any relative me to be mine has to be related to me, 
and any sense of having being an absolute me is an, is an impossible, non-relational thing, causally aloof thing, causally disconnected thing, and therefore is irrelevant to me. As the Ludwig Wittgenstein might say, it's like the beetle in the box, closed box, it just drops out. Because you never can open the box. There's, there, well, there's no difference whether there's a beetle or nothing there. In some way he gets her into this area. And of course, Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, Tsongkhapa, these great people, Buddha himself, have many different ways of coming around to this because our neural system, our mental system, our cultural system is so wrapped around the idea that we're the really real at the visceral level. Now, all of, and all of that as a meditation will bring us to an insight of the royal reason of relativity and, a, and an insight of emptiness, into emptiness. And we can attain that as a process of reflective meditation. And then the one-pointedness must come when we reach, because in each of those, in the, we, get the, we then get the fourth key, which is called the realization of the freedom from true plurality. So unity or plurality freedoms or sameness difference freedoms. You can call the two, those two keys different ways, and they're considered actually very strong and powerful in working toward the highest one, which is the royal reason, which is what's the third key system. Okay? So then what you have now, at the concluding this meditation, this means that what is sort of proposed at the boundary of what where propositions can reach is that enlightened awareness is an awareness where you're not there. You're dissolved under analysis at the same time as you're there as a relational being. So you're now there in a way that is not there, which is a very different way of being there as being there and being really there. And then this is to push toward the visceral level, where you're viscerally really there. So you even can experience that viscerally. And here, the last thing to meditate on is, is the image of the mirror. And the mirror reflection is very, very important. Because we, in a way, can already do that. Since you know what a mirror reflection and how it happens and so on, you have a sort of, certain explanation for it and you've experienced mirror reflections a lot. You look at your face in the mirror, or you look in the rear view mirror in your car at the traffic behind you, and you see your right eye as your left eye, left eye as your right eye. You see cars behind you as right-hand drive cars, etc. Your left, right, reverse everything in the mirror image. But otherwise, it looks like you could reach through the mirror, mirror as if it were a piece of glass, a window, and go into a three-dimensional space there. But yet, you know it's only a reflection. You, your mind knows that intuitively without thinking it. Without, you're relatively paying to attention to the details of your face or of the traffic. Completely engaged in that. You don't even think twice about this being a mirror reflection because you already know it. You experienced it. You experience the mirror not reflecting anything, just blank, you know. You know it's a blank surface. And when you put it next to a white wall, it looks blank. But, so you know that simultaneously. So you are knowing all the objects in it, sort of in your relational knowing, and an intuitive knowing simultaneously, which is a negation that these objects are three-dimensional objects, negates them. You, it blows away your attachment to them as three-dimensional objects. And so your, your intuitive knowing, unarticulated intuitive knowing, is simultaneous with your detailed, you know, interactive knowing. Right? So that's the way in which you re-experience relativity, subject-object differences, self-other differences, awake-asleep differences. You experience them on the uh, an inconceivably
complex mirror surface. You know, to add our own thing, a membrane, membraneous mirror surface, that all relative things that cover and permeate and entangle all relative things. So you know their unreality in the way they seem to be to you at the same time as you know their relative reality as an illusory way of engaging with them. And so you realize that, and you do this kind of conceptually, and we are doing now, and even you have to catapult past what you can express conceptually using a, a metaphor, a simile, simile of a mirror reflection, or a simile of the moon and water, or a simile of a, a magical illusion. Adding that to your ordinary reasoning, but the actual experience of it is in, said to be inconceivable, but at least you kind of know that whatever inconceivability it is, it is this complex, non-dual thing that embraces the duality of absolute and relative. And it sees with total detail and concern the relative as if it were the absolute. And then, the final step here, which I won't go into detail, I'm going to stop here, but I just want to mention it and we'll go into detail in the morning. And that is, final step is then the concern of the quality of the relative things becomes your absolute concern. So that means your, your, your wisdom examining the absolute reality to discover it finds it to be the relative reality. And then that, set, that sort of absolute drive or absolute seeking the real thing becomes that the real thing then becomes the concern about the relative quality of the relative reality. And that's when wisdom becomes compassion. Because then you, you, you perceive that in the inconceivable and you, your mind expands enormously because knowing that this relativity is the absolute is in the mirror surface. And so it kind of, everything becomes transparent. And then you're not just enclosed in so much in the near, the near rel relative environment. And your mind expands inconceivably. And therefore, any pain experienced by any mind, any sensitivity, any nervous system of any sentient being or sensitive being, which means sensitive being, you becomes your concern to make it better, to alleviate that pain. That's what compassion is, your determination to remove that pain. So, so then that's, that's what wisdom, they say wisdom becomes compassion. Or, they say, or speaking it sort of more objectively, they say emptiness becomes the womb, gives birth to compassion. Because in a way, that nice Pema Chodron wrote a book called Wisdom of No Escape. Because your absolutism has had to give up. Emptiness, voidness has liberated it from the fantasy of escaping into any separate place. And yet it can experience the relational place where it's always been simultaneously as separate. So therefore, that which gives a kind of intuitive bliss to engagement with it. And they call that bliss void indivisible. And from the basis of bliss void indivisible, then compassion becomes energized because compassion as mere empathy is, is not real compassion because empathy is feeling the suffering of the other but when you feel it without wisdom, where you think that it's a real thing, it's really their suffering, then you really feel it, and then there's no hope of alleviating it, because it's really what it is. But when you realize it's, it's reflected in the mirror of emptiness, and you simultaneously have the bliss of melting into emptiness, then the, the bliss gives the energy that it doesn't have to stay suffering even in the other being who doesn't know anything yet. So that's when wisdom becomes compassion, which is the intolerability and the determination to remove the suffering of the other. Just like you don't, when you have your own hand on a hot burner, pot in a fire, you don't say, oh, 
I don't know if there's any way of anything being better. I'll just accept it as it is. In no way. You don't discuss it. You remove your hand from the fire. And that's better. Without discussion. Without consideration. You follow me? So then other people's hands in the fire, their minds in the fire of delusive ignorance, frustrated hatred and desire and delusive self-enclosure and depression becomes intolerable to you. And so you just have to get them out of that fire. Your bliss wants them out of that fire. And then that's true compassion. Then you'll think of how to do it. It doesn't just mean you bliss at them. <laughs> Because then they might think you were weird. <laughs> Running around blissing when they're burning. You become médecins sans frontières. You, know? you become doctors without borders. Okay, ding. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely relevant. That's just what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> so we're going till 5.30, so we'll just keep going until, unless you need a big break. Um, so I'm going to, I want to come in. We don't go till 6. Do, do we go to 6? Yeah. I don't know. I think dinner's at 6. Dinner's, okay, good. Sorry. We can go to 6. Okay. Good, we have time. Okay. Um, that, that space that Bob just took us to between the me, the, the me and the not me. Uh, I want to come to that from a different place, uh, starting with my, uh, my friend Winnicott. Uh, so, ah. so this is his... Uh, <laughs> so Bodhisattva friend. When, when we imagine the, uh, the umbrella and the tree and the, the, um, the figures in the tree beaming light down at us, I, I have Winnicott up there. So this is his great book, Playing in Reality, for those of you who might be interested. It's actually very readable. I'm going to read you just from the beginning. Um, where This is the book where he talks about uh, what he calls transitional objects, or transitional experiencing, or transitional space. And uh, he's talking right from the beginning uh, about uh, that time in an, in an infant or young child's life when they have to make the first moves to separate from the all-pervasive uh, presence of the mother. I couldn't hear that. It's okay. It's just the phone going off. Okay. She, her phone is going off. Oh, oh sorry. I, we, we do a nice meditation sometimes where, I, where I have everyone turn their phones on. Um, anyway, the book is playing in reality, and he talk, he's talking about the, when the infant or young child yes. makes the first moves uh, away from the all-present mother. And in order to create a space where they're not totally alone and full of anxiety, it becomes necessary to establish some kind of intermediate zone where the mother, is, the, the remnant of the mother is still there, um, but, in, but she's experienced not exactly in symbolic form, but in uh, transitional form. So let me read you from him before I try to explain it, because I think what, what I believe is that somehow in meditation, but what we're doing is simultaneously recreating that experience that we had before we have memory of it. You know, those first four years, it's, uh, it's rare that anyone has too much of a memory of those years. So I, I believe that we're both recreating that early experience of finding some kind of comfort zone, some kind of ability to soothe ourselves, to take care of our own very primitive anxieties, and that we're also simultaneously, maybe more one way for some people than others, we're 
creating another version of that transitional space where we're moving from the uh, <clears throat> what we call in Buddhism the, the delusional self um, uh, uh, instinct where we've created this kind of false self version of ourselves that we've been trying to unpack in these meditations. We're, we're creating a place where we start to look at those, that concept which is more than a concept, it's a deeply held uh, you know, in the body, but conceptually based uh, feeling of ourselves, we're starting to release that a little bit into we don't quite know what. Um, but so there's a, another version of the transitional space, but they mirror each other maybe, or they parallel each other, or they interdigitate. Um, and I think where a lot of people, in particular with addiction, uh, also, certainly with anxiety, and sometimes it does like coagulate into depression, where people get into trouble is where that, that er, those early self-soothing mechanisms never quite took hold. You know, they, either they were interfered with by parents who were too eager to push you towards independence, or you don't even have to blame it on the parents. You know, it just things didn't go right there, so anxieties or fears of anxieties got uh, kind of established as the main thing in the psyche and then when various behaviors, masturbation or uh, early drug use or uh, other people you know, who you become attached to, they come in and work you know, imperfectly as uh, soothing elements that we then get attached to. But let me read you from Winnicott before I go on too far. So this is just from the very beginning of, excuse me, of his book. Can, you can all hear me okay, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll read it not chanting reading, but just like <laughs> reading. reading. <laughs> but it'd be interesting to do a chanting reading. Sure. It is well known that infants, as soon as they are born, tend to use fist, fingers, thumbs in stimulation of the oral erotic zone, in satisfaction of the instincts at that zone, and also in quiet union. He's a beautiful writer, by the way. It is also well known that after a few months, infants of either sex become fond of playing with dolls, and that most mothers allow their infants some special object and expect them to become, as it were, addicted to such objects. There is a wide variation to be found in a sequence of events that starts with the newborn infant's fist-in-mouth activities and leads eventually on to an attachment to a teddy, a doll, or soft toy, or to a hard toy. It is clear that something is important here other than oral excitement and satisfaction, although this may be the basis of everything else. Many other important things can be studied, and they include the nature of the object, the infant's capacity to recognize the object as not me, the place of the object, outside, inside, or at the border. The infant's capacity to create, think up, devise, originate, produce an object. The initiation of an affectionate type of object relationship. I've introduced the terms transitional objects and transitional phenomena for designation of the intermediate area of experience between the thumb and the teddy bear, between the oral eroticism and the true object relationship, between primary creative activity and projection of what has already been interjected, between primary unawareness of indebtedness and the acknowledgement of indebtedness. Indebt by indebtedness, he means the ability to say thank you to the mother who's been taking care of you. So, between primary unawareness of indebtedness, where you just take her for granted, and the beginning of acknowledgement of, oh yes, there's another person there who uh, I've been you know, ruthlessly uh, uh, sucking on, uh, and I can say thank you to her. By this definition, an infant's babbling and the way in which an older child goes over a repertory of songs and tunes while preparing for sleep come within the intermediate area as transitional phenomena along with the use made of objects that are not part of the infant's body, yet are not fully recognized as belonging to external reality. 
So that pertains to the mantras also, you know, the specific use of the mantras. Of every individual who has reached to the stage of being a unit with a limiting membrane and an outside and an inside, it can be said that there is an inner reality to that individual, an inner world that can be rich or poor and can be at peace or in a state of war. This helps, but is it enough? My claim is that if there is a need for this double statement, there's also a need for a triple one. The third part of the life of a human being, a part that we cannot ignore, is an intermediate area of experiencing to which inner reality and external life both contribute. So see, he's talking about the relational matrix, he's, which he has no, he's not schooled in that way of thinking, but he's come to it. You know, this, intermediate area of experiencing that he puts in italics and makes a verb to which inner reality and external life both contribute. It is an area that is not challenged because no claim is made on its behalf except that it shall exist as a resting place for the individual engaged in the perpetual human task of keeping inner and outer reality separate yet interrelated. I am here staking a claim for an intermediate state between a baby's inability and his growing ability to recognize and accept reality. Did you read that sentence again? Sure. I am here staking a claim for an intermediate state between a baby's inability and his growing ability to recognize and accept reality. So that, that from our, for our purposes, that would be what we're doing in meditation. You know, we're creating this intermediate area where we're coming with all our prejudices and our expectations and our habitual convictions and our, our stories about who we are, and then we're confronting reality, like, oh, who are we really? Like this flux of sensation, like I thought I was here, but I can't find myself, and uh, you know, which is more real? The meditation experience, you know, I think, is with this intermediate area, some version of the intermediate area that Winnicott is talking about. I'm going to keep going just for a bit. Out of all of this, there may emerge something or some phenomenon, perhaps a bundle of wool or the corner of a blanket or eider down or a word or tune or a mannerism that becomes vitally important to the infant for use at the time of going to sleep and is a defense against anxiety, especially anxiety of a depressive type. Perhaps some soft object or other type of object has been found and used by the infant, and this then becomes what I am calling a transitional object. This object goes on being important. The parents get to know its value and carry it round when traveling. The mother lets it get dirty and even smelly, knowing that by washing it, she introduces a break in continuity in the infant's experience, a break that may destroy the meaning and value of the object to the infant. I suggest that the pattern of transitional phenomena begins to show at about four to six to eight to 12 months. Purposely, I leave room for wide variations. It's important to note, however, that there is no noticeable difference between boy and girl in their use of the original not-me possession, which I am calling the transitional object. Uh, uh, just to interrupt, when, uh, when uh, our children were young and we were going to the airport one time, uh, we had one, one of the transitional objects, of, I think, that my daughter had at the time was called a wiggle worm. And it was like a wiggle, a, a wiggle worm, and it was uh, like a snake-like stuffed thing that we carried with us everywhere, dirty, smelly, and so on. And we left it in the taxi. Um, as we were going to LaGuardia or something. And it was a huge crisis, mostly for my wife and myself. Um, <laughs> but we, uh, uh, which is sort of getting at what he's saying here, that the parent, it becomes very important to the parents, you know, this object, which, which is, you know, not, not, not the child, not us, but the intermediate object. And we tracked it down, you know, we had a rendezvous with the taxi driver to, to get, you get something outrageous with it. Mm -hmm. What is it that you did with the wiggle worm? Uh, I, uh, we, we, we re I think we reproduced it. I think we got a couple of Oh, you found an that. extra wiggle worm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is the uh, friends of ours, you know, who were trying to wean their child 
who, who had carried a blanket around, you know, for what they thought was too long, uh, on the advice of some pediatricians, I think, cut the blanket up, you know, into halves and then quarters and then eighths, so that eventually the poor girl had nothing left. And she became anorectic later in life. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's all right. Um, so he, he goes on. Uh, he, he goes on. Summary of special qualities in the, in the relationship. And he lists them, but he likes to make these lists when it comes. One, the infant assumes rights over the object, and we agree to this assumption. Nevertheless, some abrogation of omnipotence is a feature from the start. So what, what's he saying there? That... Uh, that the wiggle worm has like special power in the household, and we agree to this <coughs> assumption. But the child, in accepting the wiggle worm as a substitution, is releasing the parents a little bit from their their duties to be omnipotent uh, figures in his or her life forever. It's the beginning of a separation. The object is a, this is two. The object is affectionately cuddled as well as excitedly loved and mutilated. <laughs> And for when it comes to the mutilated part is important, as we'll, I'll get into later, maybe tonight. Um, we'll talk about that. Three, it must never change unless changed by the infant. Four, it must survive instinctual loving and also hating, and if it be a feature, pure aggression. That gets back to the mutilation part. Okay. And, and also, see, I, I think and this is sometimes pushed away in Buddhist circles, even Western Buddhist circles, that the, uh, the emotions, I'm mostly interested in how to use what we're talking about in this weekend in terms of emotional life. I think because I'm a therapist and that's what, that's what I'm interested in. But um, there, there can be a tendency to, in the pursuit of, uh, of nirvana, of awakening, and so on, and in the name calling that we do with uh, the raw instinctual emotions like anger and uh, desire and so on, to look at those more primitive emotions as poisons and to, to then further demonize them, uh, and then to estrange ourselves a little bit, to push them away or pull ourselves away from their raw power rather than familiarizing ourselves with them within the intermediate space that meditation creates. And I think Winnicott's very good about, the, uh, about this in, in terms of the child's experience and the parent's experience. He makes a lot of room for the natural anger, the ruthless love, the mutilation, the hate, and so on, that exists in loving relationships. And uh, as a psychotherapist, that, you know, that's one of the great contributions, I think, that Western psychoanalytically influenced psychotherapy can make to this whole discussion is that we don't have to be so scared of those emotions that when we, when we look at them within a loving field, a relational field, uh, they have no more power than the self of injured innocence or any other, than the, than the floor or the chair, any other aspect of things. You know, they too will dissolve in the loving embrace of, of uh, emptiness. So let me get back to that was four, must survive aggression. Five, yet it must seem to the infant to give warmth, or to move, or to have texture, or to do something that seems to show it has vitality or reality of its own. And see, I would say that applies to meditation also. Six, it comes from without our point of view, but not so from the point of view of the baby. Neither does it come from within, it is not a hallucination. Seven, its fate is to be gradually allowed to be de decaffected. De decaffected is a Freudian term, meaning to, that you uh, let go of your investment in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, its fate is to be gradually allowed to be de decaffected, so that in the course of years, it becomes not so much forgotten as relegated to limbo. By this I mean that in health, the transitional object does not go inside, nor does the feeling about it necessarily undergo repression. It is not forgotten, and it is not mourned. It loses meaning, and this is because the transitional phenomena have become diffused, have become spread out over the whole intermediate territory 
between inner psychic reality and the external world as perceived by two persons in common. That is to say, over the whole cultural field. At this point, my subject widens out into that of play and of artistic creativity and appreciation and of religious feeling and of dreaming and also of fetishism, lying and stealing, the origin and loss of affectionate feeling, <laughs> drug addiction, the talisman of obsessional rituals, etc. And I think this is that last part about the diffusion into, that's true of meditation also, you see. Like we get attached to our, uh, our form, We're watching the breath, vipassana, mm -hmm. mindfulness, the mantra, even emptiness. <coughs> But when, the, when you've used it, when you've, the Buddha used the uh, metaphor of um, uh, to cross a river you need a raft, but he gave a famous sutra like, when you get to the other side of the river, monks, what do you do with the raft? And they say, well, do you, do you carry it with you on your shoulders for the rest of your life, or do you store it under the bushes, under the grasses by the side of the river? And they say, yes, we store it. And, you know, correct. You put the raft down. So, the meditation that Bob was just leading, where ultimately we come to the place where this very reality is already suffused with the emptiness that we've been seeking, that's the equivalent of the, you know, when my daughter finally was able to put the, her teddy bear in, in a shoebox before she went to college, and we put it in the, in the closet, you know, that's the, because a creative expression, you know, the ability to dream and to play and to engage with the mind uh, becomes that area of intermediate experience. That's what Winnicott is saying. And also, you know, then a spiritual pursuits and so on. Can I read you a little more? It's true that the piece of blanket or whatever it is is symbolical of some part object, such as the breast. Nevertheless, the point of it is not its symbolic value so much as its actuality. It's not being the breast or the mother, although real, is as important as the fact that it stands for the breast or the mother. When symbolism is employed, the infant is already clearly distinguishing between fantasy and fact, between inner objects and external objects, between primary creativity and perception. But the term transitional object, according to my suggestion, gives room for the process of becoming able to accept difference and similarity. I think there is a use for a term for the root of symbolism in time, a term that describes the infant's journey from the purely subjective to objectivity. And it seems to me that the transitional object, the piece of blanket and so on, is what we see of this journey of progress toward experiencing. I think that's enough there. I think that's it. Let me just stop with him there. So, I'm very interested, especially in my, uh, um, uh, in my meditation teachers, the people who have influenced me the most, I'm always very interested when they will actually talk personally about uh, what, what emotional uh, um, uh, sticking points they had to confront in their practice. And so I've, uh, over the years, collected uh, as much as anyone has been willing to actually reveal, which is not very much, uh, about uh, where this process, because I, I think this process, uh, as I was saying before, um, it goes well enough for most people so that we become like grown-ups and are able to, you know, navigate ourselves in the world. But uh, there are, I know for myself, there were sticking points uh, such that when I first met my current, current wife, we've been married for 30, 33 years or so, um, when we first got together, uh, I had a very hard time. Um, not because things weren't good, I was you know, completely sure of the love that I was experiencing, but I had a very hard time going to sleep at night uh, and separating from her in, in very, like, ways I should have been able to. Um, and uh, I, luckily I had a very good therapist at the time, uh, so I was able not to destroy my early marriage by you know, insisting on uh, attention all through the night. 
uh, but uh, I had a therapist that I could go to down the street. But um, I, I started having dreams when I did get to sleep uh, that would, I would wake suddenly from of my teeth crushing each other. Uh, and and uh, as I continued to have the dreams, the, the various themes would emerge where I would be trying to uh, make a telephone call. In those days, we still had rotary phones. I would be trying to make a telephone call, and the, the phone would dissolve in my hands as I was trying to call like my friend or my wife or my parents or somebody. Uh, and then the, as the phone would disintegrate, then I would wake up with my teeth crushing against each other. Oh, horrible, horrible. Um, and I took those dreams to my therapist who right away said, oh, that's just primitive oral rage. You know? So primitive oral rage is a psychoanalytic concept that Winnicott was very good about. Uh, that in that time, whether we're breastfed or not breastfed, in that time of weaning, when the separation that he's talking about is meant to take place, and I did have a blanket that I do have some memories of, so it's not, it's not I wasn't consumed with oral rage when I was three or four, I don't think, but uh, something of it was still in me, had not been metabolized, had not been processed, and the, the love which uh, had really surprised me when, uh, when I met my wife, uh, I think he evoked it again, the, what had not been worked through. So he named it for me, oh, that's oral rage. So the, the infant, you know, wanting the breast, based, to put it in symbolic form, uh, can't find it, and instead, you know, sort of uh, uh, starts to eat away at its own support. Um, so uh, I had more dreams, once he named it for me, that uh, actually culminated in a memory, which doesn't happen all the time in therapy. I, I tend to discourage people in therapy from searching for the, you know, the one memory that's going to put everything in place. But, uh, but I did have a memory of my parents uh, being uh, on vacation with myself and my then younger sister uh, when I was probably three or four, probably four years old, uh, on vacation in Cape Cod at a little house next door to their other friends. And they would, my parents would go next door to play bridge with their friends, and they had the two houses linked by a, an intercom, which I uh, uh, remembered viscerally, the, uh, this kind of intercom where you have buttons that you pushed. And they left me babysitting for my little sister, because I was a very responsible young boy. Uh, at the age of four, she was like one and a half. And they said, you know, if she cries, just like call us on the intercom. And um, I think I did have to call them once. But I think that level of responsibility, you know, it's like a little premature um, uh, for me. And there was anxiety there, which uh, entered into those dreams, you know, of uh, early, too early separation that then, you know, came into full bloom. Um, so uh, they, the, luckily those teeth crushing dreams went away. Um, after an, enough therapy and, and uh, that memory and so on. And uh, I've managed not to push my wife uh, too far away with, with my neediness or my separation anxiety. So that, that's a story that I, I told a little bit of in Thoughts Without a Thinker. Um, but I, I find that it's helpful as a therapist to be able to uh, you know, not just stay in the place of the blank screen and so on, but to uh, to be able to use my own travails to help other people. Because many people come with variations of uh, uh, that kind of thing. And they find it, and um, uh, they sort of get a kick out of, uh, oh, really primitive oral wage? I, I have that, you know? Uh, it can be helpful to name it. So uh, our, friend, our mutual friend, Sharon Salzberg, uh, who sometimes the three of us teach together. And those of you who don't know her, she's a, a Vipassana teacher, a wonderful Vipassana teacher who I've actually known since uh, that first summer when I went to Naropa. I was 20 years old, turned 21 that summer. And I met Sharon that summer. Uh, she was, I think, a year older than me. And um, uh, the, sec the next summer at Naropa, uh, Danny Goldman, my uh, a friend and teacher was supposed to come and teach a course in Buddhist psychology with Jack Cornfield, and he couldn't come at the last minute, and um, he asked uh, Sharon and I to sit in for him, although we knew hardly anything. Uh, we sat in for, for him in this course at Naropa and taught Buddhist psychology when we were 21 years old. 
Um, so Sharon uh, uh, co-founded the meditation center uh, called IMS in Bay Area. And um, she's been coming to Tibet House uh, uh, every yeah. Tuesday night that she's in New York and here teaching Vipassana. And, yeah, you want to ask something? Yeah, I have a question. Um, one of the things that I experience um, with um, my clients, especially towards the end of the life of the animal, is their inability to let go. Yes. They hold on so tightly. Um, and I'm wondering if this is something that is associated with what you are explaining right well, now. Well, any kind, any kind of holding on is definitely associated with what I'm talking about right now. You, as a veterinarian, really know. I, I mean, I don't, I don't think it does the relationship justice to call the, the um, owner's relationship with their dog or whatever just that the dog is their transitional object, because it's the dog is a real being, you, you know. But the. The, uh, much of the way we use each other, whether in love relations or with pets or with children or with, you know, much of the way we use each other has this element to it. Um, so uh, the, the, the understanding, the, the, the only real antidote to the, uh, the pain of loss is the Buddha's wisdom, you, you know, that uh, when, no matter what kind of love between two beings exists, one of them is destined to lose the other, you know? That change is, really is the fabric of, uh, this, of the universe, but that everything keeps going, you know? So that to see change, to see the, like the death of a loved one as wrong, you know, it is to torture yourself more. It's bad enough, it's hard enough to let go, to be blaming self or other for it only makes it worse. So I deal with that all the time in my work because over time people have found me, people have had terrible losses of children and you know, loved ones and so on. So uh, people can let go, they do, because you have to. And because we've all had to let go of our transitional objects also. So uh, you can normalize that for them. Uh, Sharon, uh, wrote a beautiful book called Faith. It was one of her first books, and uh, uh, in which, um, uncharacteristically, she revealed a lot of her early life. She normally doesn't talk so openly uh, about all the suffering that she went through, but she very courageously did in this book. And um, uh, I think it's a very, very, very beautiful and helpful thing, uh, and it pertains a lot to our topic for the weekend. So. Uh, I'm going to read you in her words. This is again from the very beginning. We all tell ourselves some kind of story about who we are and what our life is about. Our theme might be the pursuit of money, sex, or prestige. It might center on love or spirituality. Some of us figure as a hero in the story, some as an anti-hero. Our story might be picaresque, romantic, or tragic. We might frame ourselves as optimists or pessimists, winners or losers. How we interpret our own experiences gives rise to the narratives to which we dedicate our lives. Some stories weave the fragments of our experience into a greater whole in a way that reveals relationship and connection. Others lock us into the fragments, leaving us nowhere to turn. As is the case for many, the story I told myself for years was that I didn't deserve to be happy. Throughout my childhood, I believed that something must be intrinsically wrong with me because things never seemed to change for the better. My father, whom I adored, disappeared when I was four, and my mother and I moved in with my aunt and uncle. One night when I was nine years old, my mother and I were home alone. She had recently undergone surgery and seemed to be recovering well. In celebration of her return, I was wearing my ballerina Halloween costume. We were sitting close together on the couch, watching her favorite singer, Nat King Cole, on television, when suddenly she began bleeding violently. I ran out into the hallway to get someone to help us, but couldn't find anyone. My mother managed to tell me to call an ambulance immediately and then to call my grandmother, whom I hardly knew, to come get me. Shaking uncontrollably, I complied. After that evening, I never saw her again. 
About two weeks later, she died in the hospital. After that, I lived with my father's parents and rarely heard mention of my mother again. My childhood continued to unfold through terrifying, uprooting turns and incomprehensible losses. When I was 11, my grandfather died, and one day my father returned. The handsome prince I'd secretly imagined had been replaced by a disheveled, hard-bitten, troubled stranger. A few days after he arrived, my entire body broke out in hives. When I got back from the doctor's office, my father told me, you have to be tough to be able to survive life. Six weeks later, he took an overdose of sleeping pills. I stood outside in the cold, holding my grandmother's hand among a crowd of gawking neighbors as he was carried out on a stretcher. I watched as the flashing red lights receded and the sirens faded. Now both of my parents had been spun away from me in the back of an ambulance. That night, my father entered the mental health system. He was never able to function outside of it again. One of the hardest parts of all the loss and dislocation was that it was surrounded by an ambient, opaque silence about what was happening. Because no one spoke openly or even acknowledged all the changes as loss, my immense grief, anger, and confusion remained held inside. Whenever the cover slipped, I scrambled to hide the feelings or distort them so no one would really know, especially not myself. So I just want to interrupt here. You can see the, the transitional object that Winnicott's talking about, although Sharon is now 9 or 10 or 11 years old, she at least needed that because her, in response to the loss, to the traumas and so on, she had nowhere to go, not even to her teddy, you know. Everything's being held inside, so to the extent that she has to even deny it to herself. And I think one of, one of the things that the young child gets in its um, relationship to this object, which can be loved, mutilated, handled, talked to, sewn to, and which has a kind of life of its own, not the life of a pet necessarily, but it, it, it doesn't change unless changed by the, by the child. Sharon, at, at this time, she has nothing, okay? Just her mind, which uh, is in a state of reactivity such that it, she can't really let go in any way, you know? Because uh, the feelings are too overwhelming. I scrambled to hide the feelings or distort them so that no one would really know, especially not myself. So this is an, it's an exaggerated version of something, but it's not out of most of our experience. When John Kennedy was assassinated, I couldn't stop crying. My grandmother asked me why, and I replied simply, because his children have lost their father. The story I was telling myself was that what I felt didn't matter anyway. What I felt didn't matter anyway. It seems as if I spent most of my childhood, even my teenage years, curled up in bed, lost in a separate, shadowed existence built of sadness. I repeatedly invented scenarios of having parents just like everybody else. The dream of answering just like anybody else the school teacher's question, what does your father do for a living, was the kindling that fed the fire of many of my secret fantasies. At least she had this. I'd summon images of my mother coming back as though from a long trip, like anyone else's mother might. But I wasn't at all like anybody else seemed to be. Of course, none of them were like they seemed either, but I didn't know that then. Feeling so different, I liked playing it safe more than anything. Seeing life from a distance, never really engaging, preferring to lose myself in the seductive play of, of listlessness. That's a beautiful yeah, phrase. Yeah, the seductive play of listlessness. Oh, yeah. So instead of the play of Winnicott, you know, which is like what, what his whole book, Playing in Reality, is about, where the child is creatively engaged in play, you know, this is the, the seductive play of listlessness. This is hardly play at all. While silent dreams and desires played out within me, in most situations, I'd insist with bravado, I didn't want that anyway. When I lived with my grandparents, color television was just becoming the rage. I longed for one, but they couldn't afford it. To compensate, my grandmother, who cared a lot about me, 
bought a special plastic sheet to place over the black and white screen <laughs> to create a faint illusion of color. This rainbow aura bore no relationship to the figures and settings of the stories depicted in the programs. I wanted to rip off that bizarre front and plead for the real thing. Instead, I silently tolerated the charade, not betraying my desire. I didn't care about anything, or so I hoped it seemed. I came to know very well the protection of distance, of a narrowed, compressed world. Though it was my own act of pulling back, I felt forsaken. I told myself a story that there was no way out of the world that turned me in upon myself. You can see here what I was talking last night in the six realms and so on. Like she's, she's stuck in this place, whatever realm you want to call it. But it's, and she can see now in the writing that it was self-created. But then in the moment, she didn't know. Years later, as an adult, I would find the phrase that perfectly described my dilemma. Some friends and I had rented a house near the ocean where we could practice meditation on our own for a few days. In my designated bedroom, I found a Peanuts, a Peanuts comic strip on the desk, which went something like this. The character Lucy is sitting in a little booth. A doctor is in sign, prominently displayed. She tells Charlie Brown, you know what your problem is, Charlie Brown? The problem with you is that you're you. <laughs> Crushed, Charlie Brown asks, well, what in the world can I do about that? Lucy responds in the final frame, I don't pretend to be able to give advice. I merely point out the problem. <laughs> the problem with you is that you're you, was a very familiar phrase. The me that was me was someone I had often considered a problem. Many of us seem to have an internalized Lucy who tells us that our problem is who we are and that there is no way out, little reason to have faith in ourselves or in the possibility of turning our lives around. In fact, until I was 18, Lucy ruled. My resistance to participating more fully in life came to feel like the most alive, vibrant thing about me. I often found myself in many endeavors not really trying because I was secretly sure that I'd fail. I'd learned well enough to hold life in abeyance. For years, I hardly spoke. I barely allowed myself a full-blown emotion. No anger, no joy. My whole life was an effort to balance on the edge of what felt like an eroding cliff where I was stranded. I was waiting, suspended. Though it mimics death, waiting isn't necessarily death's prelude but might rather be the life force conserving itself. When I was a child, my favorite animal was a caterpillar, like a wiggle worm, never a dog or a cat, and somehow never a butterfly. Like the body being cooled down before surgery to slow its vital functions, my very life depended on stepping out of time and expectation, depended on waiting for something. So, just coming back to Winnicott for a second. He has a great thing a little later in the book about psychotherapy, which relates to where the place Sharon has just described. When I come to state my thesis, Winnicott says, I find, as so often, that it is very simple and that not many words are needed to cover the subject. Psychotherapy takes place in the overlap of two areas of playing, that of the patient and that of the therapist. Psychotherapy has to do with two people playing together. The corollary of this is that where playing is not possible, then the work done by the therapist is directed towards bringing the patient from a state of not being able to play into a state of being able to play. I think that's my favorite thing. I suggest that we must expect to find playing just as evident in the analyses of adults as it is in the case of our work with children. It manifests itself, for instance, in the choice of words, in the inflections of the voice, and indeed in the sense of humor. So Sharon, luckily, Sharon, found the Dharma very early. She goes on to describe it. That's the, that's the rest of, the, um, uh, of what the book is about. 
um, and about her own opening up. And she, um, she, she comes to a place a couple of pages later where she says, uh, I once asked a psychiatrist friend what he considered the single most compelling force for healing in the psychotherapeutic relationship. So that, this was me that she was asking. This was you? Yeah, yeah, she asked me, but she, luckily she's not naming me here. Um, <laughs> love, he replied. I agreed with him about the transforming power of love, but wondered if there wasn't something else even more fundamental. For all we know, I suggested, what is most important to healing in therapy is that people show up for their appointments. The therapist's love can nurture healing, but it is our own faith in that possibility that impels us to show up and take each new step into the darkness. So she's talking about, for her, that's what meditation was, you know, being willing to sit down every day and enter that intermediate space in which the feelings that she had worked so hard to shut herself off from, including but not limited to the, the grief, the loss, the mourning, the sadness, mm -hmm. her own negativity, but also, and I think this is really important, also her own capacity for joy, for love, for you know, exuberant experience. Mm -hmm. um, all of that was shut down too, and, you know, they're linked. And I think in the, in the tantras, in the, in the, um, uh, the very evolved uh, Tibetan Buddhist systems that talk about the interdependence of everything, they're, they're onto that, that the, that the primitive emotions, you know, you, you, you can't just suppress them and hope to find, uh, you know, the, the God realm on the other side, that the willingness to enter into emotional experience. Mm -hmm. And we, what we're doing in meditation is creating a safe place. In Winnicott's language, we call that a holding environment. And I like the double meaning of holding, with, which we were talking about earlier. Dharma as holding, you know. Uh, that we're creating a holding environment in which everything can be experienced. It doesn't mean that we don't pull away, as Bob was saying earlier, if your hand is burning, we're not just going to experience, oh, how marvelous the burning <laughs> and feeling is. You know, there, there's uh, a, uh, a wisdom and uh, compassionate response that's there. So many people who begin to meditate, they sit with the pain in their knees for years and years until they need knee surgery. You know, that, that's not the point. The point is not to be able to hold the posture, you know, to a ridiculous um, and self-denying uh, a place. But the point is to be willing to face what's unpleasant, not just in our physical experience, but also in our emotional experience. And that by doing that, and that this is again why I like Winnicott so much, and uh, we'll have more time still tonight and tomorrow when I can talk about it, the, the um, uh, the mother, or nowadays, luckily, fathers also, the parents make emotional experience possible for the child. The child at first uh, is just filled, the, you know, the feelings come up instinctually. They don't have language even yet to name what the feelings are. They're totally dependent on the parent to, to say to them that what they're feeling is okay. Oh, you're just hungry. You know, you must be tired. Let, we need to change you. And that language starts to come in associated with emotional experience. A child who doesn't get enough of that just has you know, emotion that won't stop. You, you know, the, the parent's job is to contain it with their own physical holding, but also with the mental holding that comes out of language. And there's been a whole movement in um, the psychoanalytic world under the name of, of mentalization, um, which says that many of our most uh, emotionally challenged patients uh, actually don't have, have not internalized, have not learned how to make sense out of their emotional experiences. They feel overwhelmed immediately and have to run and act out what they're feeling without really knowing what it is. And that, that, um, that way of thinking began some 20, 30 years ago. Those of you who are therapists or have been in a lot of therapy might know about what's called dialectical behavioral therapy, which was uh, started by a woman named Marsha Linehan, who was a behaviorist in training. 
but she also had uh, a lot of Zen Buddhist training. And she had the uh, profound insight that m many suicidal, hospitalized, so-called borderline patients who therapists were afraid of because they, their emotions were so on the surface and they were so prone to acting out in various ways, cutting themselves, hurting themselves, uh, uh, um, raging, rageful attacks on the people they needed the most, uh, their parents, their loved ones, etc. That those particular patients actually, in Marsha Linehan's view, were phobic towards their own emotions. And mm -hmm. you could see in Sharon's report, some way she was more, you know, backing off so much um, that it was a kind of phobia to her emotions. But that these patients that Marshall Linehan was talking about, many of whom were hospitalized in, in long-term units in psychiatric hospitals and the days when insurance would pay for that, um, uh, actually she found were, were phobic towards their basic emotions. They didn't even know what they were. And her first intervention was to make like note cards with mad, sad, glad written on the note cards so that when um, when uh, her patients would report these experiences, she would slow them down, show them, you know, name what they were experiencing, and then teach them basic mindfulness meditation that she had learned in the Zen uh, monasteries where she had studied, and teach them how to experience the raw physical sensations of the emotions, as we were learning yesterday or this morning with bare attention such that the emotions could be tolerated, the frustrations could be tolerated long enough that these people could gain mastery to some degree over their own emotional responses. And that form of behavior, dialectical behavioral therapy, swept through the psychiatric uh, establishment. That uh, cognitive therapy and mindfulness-based stress reduction, those three uh, interventions have really uh, uh, establish themselves as pillars of treatment for people who had trouble, many people who had trouble in those early years, learning enough self-soothing that they could handle the emotions that come with the illusion of separateness. Mm -hmm. So my, my own, you know, trouble with separateness that came to me so intensely at the beginning of my marriage, you know, was my own example of that. And um, I have some more that maybe after dinner I can uh, I can talk about and some and other people who uh, have been important to me. Mm -hmm. um, so any any thoughts or questions? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much. I mean, it, it's I can't even begin to uh, articulate um, how informative and enlightening this weekend is. And based on what you just said, two things um, that I um, would appreciate some clarification on is the first in um, how to phrase this in Sharon's case um, sh her inner critic I guess to use Christine yeah. Ness words seems to be like um, like almost like an amygdala hijack so she she go but she's incredibly resilient so there's this tension because even though she is constantly, all for years, placing herself in this box where she is not entitled or feels that she's not entitled to be happy, she has this courage or this hope to, to disavow that and to keep on searching for um, the solution to that. Is there a psychological term? Yeah, well, we can make up psychological terms. Um, uh, she did have a lot of resilience. And she was only 18, you know, so she made it, she had enough care that she made it to the State University of New York at Buffalo, you know, where she took an introduction to world religion class, you know, which seems to be a good portal for some of us. And uh, she went on an exchange to India. Uh, she found teachers. Uh, who right away connected with her. She had the courage, she realized early on that she had to, it wasn't all about meditation, it was also about right motivation and right effort and so on for her, that she had to write action, that she had to mobilize herself to take risks, 
to participate, to engage, to link up with other people. So she took herself out. That, that was, that's something that, you know, those of you who are in recovery, uh, you know how important it is to go to meetings with other people. That, the, that left alone, you're much more likely to revert, to regress, to go back to the, the self-soothing mechanisms that were ultimately destroying you. So the relationships with other people are super important. Sharon found those. Uh, she found a teacher who she talks about in here, a, a teacher who I met also, a lovely woman uh, named, named Deepama, a, a Bengali woman who had lost her uh, husband early, who had suffered terrible losses, had ended up uh, in Bodh Gaya with Manindra and, and uh, practiced very hard and had all kinds of realizations. And she tuned into Sharon and told Sharon that uh, she should be a teacher because she really understood suffering. And um, that was very uh, ennobling for Sharon, that, her, that all that past suffering wasn't useless, but that could somehow um, uh, uh, help her to do good for others, you know? And Sharon's been very touched by all that. We've taught together a lot, uh, she and I, and then the three of us. She's been very touched by all this Winnicott stuff also. And she sometimes, when she talks about uh, um, her evolution, I, I heard her, there's a podcast that my friend Dan Harris, who wrote this book, 10% uh, Happier, has. And he did a very nice interview with Sharon on his podcast. And she talked there about uh, that uh, she sometimes thinks about it as that she had to reparent herself, and that the, using the Winnicott language, and that the, the, uh, uh, the meditation, the mindfulness, Vipassana, bare attention meditation, that she uh, spent so much time with was an opportunity for her to reparent in a way that uh, uh, she didn't get the first time around. Um, so that's enough psychological language, I think, to put on it. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. And from a Buddhist perspective, so then when you're meditating with difficult emotions, yes. is that a form of reparenting? Well, it, it is, yeah, it, it absolutely is. I'm a little wary of reducing it to that, which is why I'm trying to be careful about talking about the transitional space as not the, it's not the exact transitional space of a two-year-old. Um, but I would say yes, that for all of us who struggle with disturbing emotions, unruly emotions, um, that uh, the, the, the taming element, the disciplining element that we all engage in, uh, and the, the um, uh, unruly child within that doesn't want to sit there, that would rather go uh, eat some candy or have some ice cream or watch TV or, you know, read instead of meditating or whatever, or that gets angry, you know, all the stuff, the really personal stuff that you're dealing with when you're meditating, most of that is childhood stuff. It, you know, it's in an adult form more or less, but Basically, a lot of, even the verbal activity, you know, the way we all are basically re repeating the same kinds of thoughts over and over again in our heads. It's so rare when you sit and meditate and look, watch your thoughts that you're having a new, original, profound thought. You know, <laughs> most of it is really, oh, you've had this thought a thousand times, you know, like, what are you going to eat next? And your, your friend who didn't return your phone call. And, and you know, it's like, it's... The, the, the chatter is not usually benign chatter. There's a, a, an underlying you know, forlornness, or what about me, or uh, I didn't really do, it wasn't my fault, or you know, you know, a lot of that is childhood-based, I think. And if you really examine it uh, from this place of bare attention, of non-judgmental, impartial, open, you know, it just is what it is, then you see what it is. And then you have this opportunity to hold it in the largest sense of holding, to hold it with compassion, you, you know, with the compassion of the parent who doesn't overreact to a child's anxiety and get hysterical themselves, you know, but without the, the neglect of the abandoning parent who would rather go get drunk themselves than deal with you, you know. Uh, you're watching it with the, that 
the concerned interest of the, um, the parent who's willing to put himself or herself aside for the sake of the child. So you're willing to do that in meditation, you know. You'll stay with it as long as it's necessary, you know. Keep, you can keep having those thoughts. Keep, just let them keep coming. You'll, you'll hold it with bare attention, you know. You'll watch it come and you'll watch it go. Uh, you're not going to indulge it, but you won't ignore it either. That's, the, that's where this, uh, you know, the beneficence of the classic Winnicottian mother is called into play in meditation. And I think that's why it's gendered, you know, even the uh, Prajnaparamita Sutra, you know, it's gendered as female. You know, the w wisdom, uh, which is the holding mind that sees emptiness, is gendered as female. That's the female uh, element, the feminine element. I think we have to stop. I think we'll do we do more Q&A this evening yeah. at 7.30. Yeah, 7.30. And uh, the cook gets upset if we don't get there. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's 6 o'clock. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Really? Yeah. And just your share. Because you were talking about that religion class that you were talking about the Buddhism. I Oh, okay. That are similar things from my childhood. Oh, really? What? She never talks about it. Really? What was he like? She doesn't say it. Yeah. Really? But, and she would go herself on the weekend, and then she would walk. Oh. Oh. So you mentioned that the so much is that you That's too far, too far. But then you come right after that, by saying, you are supposed to sit and learn how to sit and pay. Yes.